let me get my my book just a moment here just in case uh, right so last class we discussed the forbidden word uh an idea let me just see what was this i had a strange noise here okay so we were discussing the forbidden word or interdiction that is a concept on foucault he's telling us about the mechanisms the devices to regulate and distribute discourse and we discussed that the for that the forbidden word the taboos are one of these mechanisms external to language um, reminding you that we are talking about first we're talking about mechanisms which are social uh, external to language not linguistically intrinsical so now it's time to talk about madness now the idea of madness is a, a bit more uh, wide it's wider than what we know by the the, the mentally diseases uh, madness according to Foucault uh, is a way to label a person whose speech cannot flow like uh, a standard according to uh, what it, what's considered to be normalized. So uh, it's precisely through the discourse that the mad person is recognized and cared for. So according to what the person says, according to the speech of someone, you classify the person as uh, belonging to the norm or being outside the norms of uh, discourse production. So there are changes, important changes in clinical approach to madness since Freud with the new studies on what he starts calling non-framed discourse, which is exactly this discourse that escapes the frames of the so social standards. But even so, uh, there is one procedure that remains, that is the mad person is to be excluded from society. Uh, he should go to a kind of therapy or to the clinic or to be isolated. So that's why I told you that there is much power involved in the silence of psychotherapists looking for meaning in the words of a mentally ill person. And this ill is inside inverted commas on purpose because in fact, this person produces meaning, but this person does not produce meaning the way uh, the majority of society conventioned to be normal. So the psychotherapist gives meaning to what he considers to exist in a piece of discourse. But how can one have access to another subject's thoughts? So this is a, a, a point that we should touch to avoid in our an analytical procedures uh, a tendency to arrogance to by means of discourse analysis because we are going to use uh, uh, concepts from uh, psychoanalysis uh, but by means of these concepts not to be arrogant enough to say i know what you mean we never know what the other means we have clues we have evidence, but we never know exactly what one means because meaning is not guaranteed, because meaning is contextual, because meaning is historical, meaning is subjective, meaning is uh, ideological. So what I mean here, or what I'm trying to mean here, is that meaning will depend on perspective. So a piece of discourse under analysis by me, uh, the result of the analysis may not be the same uh, if it's given to another professor such as uh, Monica Cruz, because I assume a position of analysis, I assume an angle to look at the object that may be or may not be hers. Uh, in fact, it will never be hers. It could be close to hers, but will never be the same. So different analysts uh, looking at the same object may produce different analysis. Of course, they can get close to, but they will never be the same. And this is what reminds us that meaning is ideological.
because what the analyst is doing i mean the psy the psychoanalyst or the discourse analyst what they are doing is producing meaning out of a piece of discourse so even silence is meaning and uh, as an extra reading if you are interested in the meanings that can be promoted by silence i'd recommend you in your lunges as formas do silencio in which it discusses how material silence is how much power is involved in silence so we can never have access to anyone Professor? else thoughts yes é, a gente pode dizer também que essa questão da da loucura ela depende do do contexto na qual a sociedade está vivendo, não é? Por exemplo, na Idade Média, a, por exemplo, as pessoas que queriam colocar um pouco mais a ciência em vez da religião, elas eram consideradas loucas, porque é, é. iam contra. Aí hoje em dia não, hoje em dia a gente já tem uma, uma valorização da ciência, embora também tenha a questão da, da religião, aí o discurso do louco já vai ser jogado para outro canto. A gente pode dizer isso, não é? Yes, I'm going to talk about meaning displacements. Then meaning is leapings, uh, how meaning slips. Meaning does not change. I mean, when we consider the word change as a, uh, uh, an abrupt change, but there are uh, slight changes in meaning along history. You were right, yeah. Uh, what was considered to be uh, a mad person or some uh, or a blasphemy. Uh, centuries ago is not blasphemy anymore because the changes in society because of the changes in the material conditions of production so the society we have nowadays is not the same as the one isaac newton had to face and thus there are different possible meanings and that there are different taboo words that are different interdictions you were right okay so but i'd like to alert you to the risk of arrogance of the discourse analyst uh when he or she forgets that discourse analysis deals with representation and not with the objects or concepts themselves and representation if you decompose the word you have presenting again bringing something back bringing something that's not here back by means of language so the truth is not in discourse. The truth does not even exist. It's a social construction. The analyst can only grasp clues about ways of being and doing in language and with language. Okay, so it's a possibility of interpretation. It's not the truth. I can never say uh, that I analyzed uh, somebody's discourse and it's authoritarian. I can say that in someone's discourse, there are evidence, there are marks of authoritarian uh, ideas, but never label someone or some piece of discourse definitely. It's my perspective on his, on his or hers discourse, okay? So the, the problem, the difference, I, I, I always like to say that discourse analysis is similar to psychoanalysis, but the difference is that we don't intend to cure anyone. We do not have the objective of, of producing a social framing, uh, a discursive framing, or like making someone belong to a norm. We just analyze it and we produce an interpretation of that piece of discourse, but not with the intention of making someone or some piece of discourse adequate so psychoanalysts uh, themselves uh, and psychoanalysis itself invests in the desire to teach the med to mean according to social standards to train uh, i mean not all psychoanalysts but there there's a let's bring another example that's more caricatural but it's it's valid here the coaches they want to teach you how to belong and psychoanalysis somehow looking for the cure also tries to make the person fit society now psychoanalysis intend to cure the mentally ill person of his mental disease 
And when it's applied without the proper awareness of the subjectivity issues, discourse analysis can lead to the illusion that the discourse analyst is located above language and ideology or even outside it. And there is no discourse analyst that does not have an ideology. There is no discourse analyst that will produce discourse analysis except by means of discourse. <clears throat> so when I give this class, I speak from a position. When I write a paper, I write from, from a social positioning, from my life story, from my convictions, you see? And it's impossible to get completely detached of this. Oh, professor, so it's impossible to make science, objective science. Well, we invest ourselves in the illusion of neutrality. Neutrality is like the carrot uh, tied uh, just in front of the donkey. We try to reach it, but we'll never do. We try to be the more objective we can, but we should be aware that this is just a try. This is just a constitutive, a constitutive illusion uh, when we are producing science that our science is neutral. But there's no neutrality possible in any social activity mediated by language. Okay, do you follow my my thought? Yes. So, let's consider the cases of perversion and disease and how they are analogous to madness. One of the perversions that we condemn and that we feel like we have a repulsive feeling about them nowadays is pedophily. Now, pedophily was uh, not considered madness or perversion uh, in ancient Greece. It has been normalized as perversion over history. But different historical moments have different forms of perversion and produce different attitudes towards it. So people affected by these anomalies are seen as elements that contaminate other members of society. So what should we do? In quarantine times, we know what we should do. If you have someone that is contaminated, you should isolate. You should quarantine the person. Where would you do it? In hospitals? In prisons? In uh, asylums? And so on. So the exclusion of these peoples of these people uh, is necessary to maintain the order of discourse and their social grammars, okay? Wh when I mean social grammars, the rules that society follow. So the order is to be kept. Now, keeping, maintaining the order is part of governmental discourse. The rule is that uh, who is uh, in charge of power will try to maintain power will try and will use as an argument the maintenance of order, the maintenance of the law, okay? Breaking the law is not uh, part of the interest of those who control the order of discourse. So those who have the power over discourse will try to keep this power. Those who do not have it will dispute this power. And then we have the concept of hegemonic dispute that we have in Gramsci. So examples of this exclusion uh, are, for example, as I said, ped ped pedophiles or rapists or thieves or drug addicts uh, or terminally ill patients, okay? Or they are excluded either in hospitals, in uh, jail, and so on. And the so-called terrorists, dictators, and corrupt are now a target for this kind of discourse that wants to exclude what is not part of the norm, okay? But who has the authority to name a terrorist? Why uh, 
is why are those guys who kidnapped an airplane or two airplanes and threw it over World Trade Center considered terrorists? By why has Barack Obama won the Nobel Prize of Peace? When we know that he killed thousands of people uh, in Libya. What is the difference? Because both produced death. I'd say that Obama has produced more deaths than those guys that kidnapped the planes. But who normalizes killing? And the killing of whom? And with which purpose is are these killings taking place? So I'll bring yes, you here. I, oh, yes. I, I think it's also a case of a main discourse. That it's a discourse that is kind of like everyone has it. We see yeah. Obama as a peace leader when he isn't. Because we don't, I mean, there, people uh, don't know what, what he does in Libya, for example. Yeah, yeah. It does not go. It does not go to the social media. Uh, it goes, but not with the same strength, not with the same amplitude. So it's a matter of fighting for discourse. Discourse is always under dispute. Discourse is something that we fight for. We look for hegemony. So, for example, the discourse that uh, bandido bom, bandido morto. We have this idea of social hygiene, of cleaning society, of uh, what is normally named as bandido. But what's the difference between uh, someone who lives in a community and robs for eating or a miliciano? So, uh, oh, but they, are, they kill uh, the bandidos, the robbers. Yes, but they are murderers too. So this idea of social hygiene is normally imposed by those who are in the control of this course to normalize the oppression of those who do not control this course over those who have this control. For example, who is the terrorist or the dictator or who is the leader? Recently, Donald Trump met Kim Jong-un, and he didn't call him a terrorist. He called him a Korean leader. Why is Kim Jong-un a, uh, a Korean leader, but, but why is Nicolas Maduro a dictator in the official discourse of the president of the United States? You see, there's much power involved. Maybe because Kim Jong-un has... Uh, some technological knowledge enough to threaten the United States, enough to start again uh, an armamentist run, maybe because of geopolitical reasons, you see? So these terminologies, dictator, leader, terrorist, they are not stable. They change in history, they change according to the social, polit political, economic changes. As politics changes, discourse changes. As history moves on, discourse moves on. Discourse is completely historical. Let's remember that discourse means language in movement, language in course. So as we have seen in Laraya, the terrorist or the barbaric is the one who, by means of his or her habits, usually causes strangeness and most frequently uses force to impose his or her customs on others. Or those who threaten my hegemony. For example, the Muslims, this, is, this was very common at the beginning of the years 2000. The Muslims were represented as non-Christian. And in a country in which the majority of the population is Christian, this is equivalent to saying that the person is not from God. But who is God or who are the gods? 
From the Crusades to the Trump and Bolsonaro era, we have fought to defend and impose our way of producing meaning over the meanings of the other. This is valid for the Trump-Bolsonaro era, but this is also valid in medieval period with the uh, try to preserve the discourse of the Catholic Church on, under the do domain of uh, an era over the domain of the Catholic Church. This is valid for Marxism and its experience in the Soviet Union with the elimination uh, of uh, opposition, with the condemning of uh, people who oppose the government to to being killed or arresting those people. Uh, some of them, like Bakhtin, for example, Bakhtin was considered an enemy of the Soviet Union, although his uh, vast intellectual production uh, on language, but exactly because of this, because he showed how language is material and how authoritarian regimes on the left and on the right used language to manipulate people. So, why does nazism true? The nazism, yes. Uh, to understand this course analysis, we should put ourselves on on the shoes of those scientists, of those linguists, philosophers, psychoanalysts, and so on. They were facing a regime of extreme right in France with Charles de Gaulle, but the experience in the Soviet Union was not what we could call a democratic experience. There was a degeneration movement after Lenin's death in the Soviet Union. So those new theorists of what we call the new left, they were opposed to the barbaric way that capitalism took place in the West, and especially in the dicta uh, dictatorships in Latin America uh, and in Europe. But also, they were not in favor, they were against, and they were critical of the regimes produced by the Soviet Union and supported by the Soviet Union and, and Marxism, the way it took place. So they were looking for what they call the uh, democratic socialism, you see, or even... Uh, democratic liberalism, on the other hand. Foucault was one of those uh, philosophers, thinkers, that at the beginning of his writings, he flirted with neoliberalism, although in a second moment of his academic career, he questioned, especially in the biopolitics, he questions neoliberalism as an ideology of having no ideology, as what he calls... <clears throat> a practical reason instead of an instrumental reason. Neoliberalism stopped being an instrument and started being the end on itself. And then he questions it. But at the beginning of his writings, Foucault was very receptive to neoliberalism. He flirted with that. Okay. Uh, so why does the Brazilian mainstream media, for example, who refers to Maduro as a dictator? But when we had the elections in Bolivia, by the end of last year, they called Janine Anye Sanchez as provisional president of Bolivia, ignoring the brute force, ignoring the kill, uh, the killings of uh, native Aboriginal people, Indians in Bolivia, ignoring that the elections were ignored and someone was led to power by means of force. And I'm not saying this from my own perspective. I'm saying this from the perspective of the uh, OEA. Just a moment, sorry. Gosh. Uh, so uh, what is the difference between one and the other? This reveals us that everyone has a positioning. Every institution has a positioning. Even if you think you have no positioning, when you try to be what we call isentão, you are positioning yourself because you are uh, abdicating of disputing discourse. And thus, you leave discourse 
in those hands in which uh, it customarily is. So, for example, is impeachment always a coup d'etat? If we say that, if we assume that, we should say that color suffered a coup. But if, if we say that it's never a coup d'etat, then we have to admit that what happened to Dilma Rousseff was not coup. So you see how contextual it is. The same left-wing parties that claimed uh, that Collor's impeachment was completely legal argument on the illegality of Dilma's. I'm not saying they are right or wrong, but I'm, I'm trying to show you that the word impeachment can mean something in the 1990s and can mean something else in the 2000s. Because meaning changes with history. So democracy, the notion of democracy. Democracy is a word that has gained different meanings over history. Democracy in the French Revolution is not the same democracy in Brazil 2020. It does not have the same, the, exactly the same meaning. Which is more democratic, the United States or Venezuela? Depending on the ideological position someone assumes, this person will say that the United States is more democratic because you have freedom of speech, freedom of press, because this, because that. But some others will say, well, Venezuela is democratic because the president was elected directly and Joe Biden in a delegate system. Venezuela is more democratic because uh, you shouldn't wait four years for the president to be taken off government. There are each two years there are uh, referendums that consult population if the president should call new elections. So uh, there's no neutrality. When we speak, we are always assuming a point of view. And this is my point here. So this class has a point of view over what is language. Some people will say that language is what is in the dictionary. Language is objective. What I said is what I said, period. And some people will say what you said is not exactly what you said, but what you have been told before. And the way your mind was prepared to keep saying what you have heard before. You see? It's when Foucault says that he would like to speak as if there were a voice, as if there was a voice before him. This is what he means by interdiscourse. We are going to talk about interdiscourse in some moments. So we have semantic slippings. Democracy is not democracy over history the same way. Dictatorship is not dictatorship. Uh, what we refer to as dictatorship two centuries ago is not what we refer to as dictatorship nowadays. A Shiit in 1980s was a radical. Nowadays, Shiites are oppressed in, Palest in Palestine. A communist is not... Uh, uh, the communist from the Cold War is not the communist for, for, for nowadays. People who at the Cold War would be called reformists or social democrats nowadays are being called communists by the extreme right. The same for fascist, Nazi, and so on. Saddam Hussein is an example of this. Saddam Hussein was supported by U.S. forces as a Shiite because he was the leader of a movement of resistance over the influence of the Soviet Union. He was financially supported, but he became, uh, he became not, an, not a very comfortable presence when Cold War was over. And then the term shit, which was used to describe radical people, it started slipping, and now shits are oppressed people. I remember when I was in the Students' Union, when there were those radical guys from PSTU and so on, we used to call that they were Shiitas. Ah, fulano é Shiita. Hoje o Shiita é considerado oprimido pela maioria Sunita. Saddam Hussein era um Sunita. You see how meaning changes alongside with history. So, in Afghanistan, 
Uh, Osama bin Laden used to be an ally. After some time, he was considered a terrorist. Okay. So, uh, but in Afghanistan, maybe he was considered a nationalist leader and so on. So Foucault studies uh, asylums, prisons, and taboos, especially on humans, human sexuality, but they can be transposed to other areas of human experience. Okay. Uh, let's consider the, the way we deal with homosexuality, okay, in a not too distant past. Uh, years ago, I mean, like two or three decades ago, the, the World Health, Health Organization considered homosexuality as a disease, which should be cured. So those people were considered to be sick or crazy or immoral, and they should be cured of such immorality. How about now? Is homosexuality is still considered a disease, I mean, in official health discourse? No. According to health discourse, no. But have you come across this kind of representation? Still in the 2000s, in the 2020s, do we still have this representation of the homosexual as a sick person, as someone to be cured? Yes. We find it in religious and political discourse. Why? Because uh, discourse, discourse changes are not an abrupt process. They are a historical process, and during some time, these two kinds of representation coexist and they dispute hegemony. But this shift happens when the authorized uh, institutions, when the authorities uh, claim that homosexuality is not a disease, and they eliminate that from the list of the World Health Organization. So they form a very important, the homosexuals, in fact, if you consider the marketing perspective, they form a very important market niche for which the term perverting could exclude their right to consume, which in no ways will comply, will do with the objectives, with the uh, goals of the capital. The second event that moves the Paulistan economy, the economy of Sao Paulo, is the gay parade. First, the Formula One, which we didn't have this year. Second, the gay parade. And this hits the market. This uh, promotes uh, people going to hotels, people consuming bottles, shirts, music, uh, mass culture in general. So how can we exclude them from consuming? The market wants to sell. So the market has to include. Market should, or at least tries to give us an idea that it's inclusive. But of course there is resistance from religious discourse, from conservative political discourse. You see? So the idea of homosexuality as a perversion or madness from the perspective of the market does not fulfill its purposes. Since the maintenance of power depends on the capitalist mode of production, ignoring a niche of market, whatever it may be, is the real postmodern taboo. We have the new, the new conservative ascension, I know that, but... Uh, through a segment of some religious and moralist discourse, this perception is under dispute. We are, at this moment, 2020, 2016, 2018, 2020, we are in a moment of dispute for discourse hegemony. But from the perspective of the market, people should consume in Homosexuals are a niche of discourse. Black people are an, an, a niche of, of, of consumption. Uh, Indians, uh, gays, whatever. Women with feminist discourse, you see. So it's not uh, 
something that you can, can always consider good or bad. It depends on if they are consuming or not. And this is, is very interesting to consider this case of homosexuality or feminism from the perspective of niches of market, because you will see that these movements are stimulated by capital, uh, but to a certain extent so that they won't become dangerous. It's the case of identity, identitarian movements. Well, when a woman is fighting for the women exclusively and is not fighting for the black and is not fighting for the laborers and is not fighting for the Indians, is, she's not fighting, she is isolated and she's consuming an identity. And there are shirts for her to, to, to buy and there are buttons for her to buy and there are marches for her to go. The same happens to gays, the same happens to nordestinos, the same happens for any social group that is constituted as a minority. And we call these movements minority movements. But here we have a problem with the specificities of Brazil. Black people are not a minority in Brazil. Black people are a minority in the United States, for sure. But not in Brazil. But we import the terminology because even those who try to be decolonizers are colonized sometimes. We import the terminology of movimentos de minoria. And we use it in Brazil in which black people and women are not a minority. They are a majority. And there's another problem here. A minority plus another minority plus another minority and so on results in a majority. But when... Então é por isso que os governantes recentemente disseram que o racismo não existe aqui porque é algo importado, né? Yes, yes. Uh, from a certain perspective, Bolsonaro is right. Racism is not important. But naming racism or naming the fight against racism as a minority movement is an important discourse. It's not a minority movement. It's a movement of the majority who is oppressed by 20% of the population. It's a revolt of the disempowered 80% against the empowered 20%. And I'm being generous calling them 20%. I'd say it's a war and a dispute for hegemony between 99% of the population over the richest 1%. If you would like to go deeper in this point I'm trying to develop here, you can read A Miséria da Inteligência Brasileira, Gessé de Souza. Okay? He will discuss how our academies, full of good intentions, import terms, especially from France and the US, and these terms do not exactly fit our reality. We are a country of black people. We are a country of uh, in which inequality is the rule. So we sometimes try to adapt terminologies and use terminologies from nations that are already prosper nations. They have some degree of social inclusion and bring them to our reality and force, and force this terminology in our academic writings, in our presentations, in our classes, in our militants. We should contextualize. We should know that language, discourse, and movements are contextual. And we should contextualize our ideals, our fight. This is the problem. So even when we try to decolonize, we colonize again. When we call it minority, black people are not minority. Especially in Maranhão, black people are not minority. Class struggle is not... Uh, an old concept that is surpassed. If you would like to see class struggle, go to any neighborhood in São Luís. You see that the, the outside of the neighborhood, like Vinhais, for example, is beautiful. But if you go deep into it, you see social exclusion in Vinhais, living side by side. I think the most uh, evident example of this is Rio de Janeiro. Rio de Janeiro is uh, obvious the 
the coexistence of inclusion and exclusion side by side ignoring each other so uh, it's time for us then to talk about knowledge science and our search for validating our discourse it's a concept that Foucault borrows from Nietzsche, will to power. Foucault will say that everybody wants to have power. In fact, it's Nietzsche who says that. Everybody is looking for power. Now, to have power, you should have the right to discourse. And your discourse should be acknowledged as true, as the truth. Terra plana. They want to validate this discourse as a true discourse and to invalidate the other's discourse as uh, a deceiving discourse, as a false discourse. So we fight for truth. We fight for science. When we say that we should believe science and not achismos, we are fighting for uh, the truth because we believe science is the truth and we are fighting for that and we try to fundament our discourse and our credibility on science with more science. So Foucault will borrow this analogy with the from the will to power formulated by Nietzsche and he, Nietzsche, and he, he will call it the will to truth because he, he claims that since language is material and an effective means of acquiring and maintaining power, that's it because we write articles in science through language, we produce news through language, we make political discourses through language. When we control discourses, okay, uh, through the illusion of language transparency, we attempt to acquire and control power. When we invest in the illusion, I'll try to make it simpler. When we invest in the illusion of language transparency, what is language transparency? What I said is what I said. It's not interpretative. I said we should believe science because science has the truth. This is not ideological. This is technical. What I said is just what I said. Don't try to interpret me. Don't put words in my mouth. This is investing in language transparency because we know that language is always interpretative. But when we try to eliminate these interpretative marks of language and say this is scientific, we are trying to acquire power. We are trying to borrow the power that science has, the credibility of science for us to say, I have the power because I'm on the side of the truth. You see, many Marxists, especially those fundamentalist ones, claim to have the truth about the class struggle, about the working class interests. I remember once, eu vou contar essa em português, que é boa. Eu estava saindo de um... Era eleição municipal, eu, tava, eu estudava na Unicamp ainda, estava no primeiro curso de graduação na física, eu estava saindo do bandejão, do RU, e tinha uns caras panfletando. E tinha um candidato a prefeito pelo PSTU, que era um professor da universidade filiado ao sindicato. E a gente tinha um candidato, que a, gente, a maioria das pessoas apoiavam né, dentro da Unicamp, que era o candidato mais moderado, que era do PT. E o professor panfletando e falando, o PT mente para vocês, só o PSTU fala a verdade para vocês. E vieram me dar o panfleto. E eu recusei e falei, não, muito obrigado, eu não sou religioso. Na real, a política e a religião, ambas têm esse discurso da verdade sobre as coisas. Eu digo a verdade, os outros são hereges. Eu digo a verdade, os outros são pelegos. Eu estou lhe dizendo a verdade. Eu sou médico, o outro é um, não é um especialista, é um leigo. Essa briga entre Dória e Bolsonaro sobre a vacina. Né? E nenhum dos dois é médico. Mas um usa o discurso da medicina e empresta a credibilidade de médicos, e infecto, infectologistas, biólogos. E o outro toma de empréstimo o discurso da virilidade, da masculinidade, né, que é tão comum, por exemplo, as Forças Armadas, que é a origem dele. Não sei se vocês compreendem esse, esse desejo de verdade do qual fala o Foucault. Esse desejo de verdade do qual o Foucault está falando é o nosso discurso está sempre buscando validar-se por meio da verdade. O que eu digo é verdade, portanto, quem diz diferente de mim 
Mensch. Even if what I say is a lie. But what is the truth and what is a lie in a post-truth society? In a society of fake news? In a society of WhatsApp has more credibility than the mainstream media? Maybe because mainstream media has played um, a questionable role in the recent past. For example, in supporting dictator governments. You see? Então, quando o Bolsonaro chama, é, mobiliza a sua turma para chamar Globo Lixo, né, eles têm um valor de verdade que eles querem passar aqui. Quem fala a verdade é aquele, aqueles determinados blogs, aqueles determinados sites, aquele determinado grupo de WhatsApp, que é a Globo Mente. A Globo, por outro lado, quando rotula e quando cria uma agência ou agências de verificação factual, tentam passar a ideia de que ela, a mídia mainstream, ela está passando a verdade, sem qualquer interpretação. Quando nós veremos mais tarde no princípio do comentário que toda verdade é mediada por linguagem e, portanto, ela é interpretada antes de ser transmitida. Todos têm e ninguém tem razão nesse debate. Todos estão disputando hegemonia. Ok? So, that's why it was no coincidence that in the Soviet Union, courses on language, on philosophy, were left behind or even closed uh, in detriment or in favor of courses like engineering, nuclear power, and so on, because they claimed that language was not important. Language was subjective. Language was immaterial. So uh, we hear this about human sciences. Remember Weintraub? Quem quiser se formar em sociologia, que se forme com seu dinheiro, não com o dinheiro do Estado. Agora tem as bolsas, né? tem as áreas prioritárias. Who will determine what is a priority and what is not a priority? Why is a project on the discourse of media not a priority? And why is a project on wind energy a priority? So Bakhtin will uh, argument, he will argue that precisely about the, uh, about the materiality of language. Bakhtin will say, no, language is material. Language is used to conduct, to manipulate, to, uh, I will use a term from Althusser, para inculcar as pessoas. Você inculca as pessoas por meio da linguagem. Okay, so language is material because it shapes society. It shapes the division of work. It shapes uh, prejudice. It attributes or takes over, takes off power of people. Austin, that guy from performative language, he will show us in his work how to do things with words. As we say something, that as we say something, we do something in the world. And we change the reality around us, of course, if we fulfill what he calls the felicity conditions, if we are authorized. I can give you this class because the institution authorizes me. Otherwise, this would be just an informal chat. But this is considered scientific because there is a position that I occupy at UFMA because there is a subject named as historic overview of English language, because there is a system of approving or failing students that will give me authority. Thus, language is material and will alter the material conditions of human existence, right? And when we fight for language, when we fight for discourse, when we fight, for example, for neutral gender, we are fighting for ideological positioning, We are fighting for different forms of understanding and shaping reality. And we are fighting for our truth. Both are fighting for the truth. Those who claim to be fighting against fake news and those who produce fake news. They are fighting for the truth. They are fighting to make what they say true and what the other side says false. Questions about this? 
No, professor. It's okay. okay. So, in trying to control the linguistic sign, we exert a mechanism of coercion reinforced by social institutions, which is, and which is considered uh, consistently reformulated. The will to truth is present in the idea that our society has of science, of good practices. Uh, a little bit in Portuguese. Estamos em eleições. Vocês viram algum candidato a prefeito de qualquer cidade do Brasil dizer que não vai cumprir a lei de responsabilidade fiscal? Se colocar contra a lei de responsabilidade fiscal? Não. Não. Hoje, talvez, quem seria aí o candidato mais radical né, desses que foram para o segundo turno, que está sendo nomeado como radical? Vamos pegar o caso do Boulos. Né? O PSOL talvez hoje seja o partido que disputa o poder que estaria aí no espectro político colocado mais à esquerda. Perguntaram a ele sobre a responsabilidade fiscal. E o máximo que ele conseguiu fazer foi relativizar. Falar responsabilidade fiscal não é irresponsabilidade social. Mas veja, ele não negou a responsabilidade fiscal. E a responsabilidade fiscal é um termo cunhado no seio dos economistas neoliberais. O Estado não pode gastar mais do que arrecada. Isso virou praticamente não um conceito de um lado da política, mas isso virou uma verdade absoluta para toda a política estatal. Compreendem como a coisa é trabalhada? Saiu, do, digamos assim, da classe autorizada, do segmento autorizado a produzir discursos sobre a economia, que são os economistas, sobretudo da escola liberal e neoliberal. No entanto, nem mesmo a esquerda mais radical, ou considerada, dita mais radical, nega a responsabilidade fiscal. Responsabilidade fiscal virou uma espécie de tabu. Virou uma espécie de palavra proibida. Não cumprir a responsabilidade fiscal é palavra proibida. Está no nível do, do Forbidden World que o Foucault coloca. Então, quem é contra ela, sequer tem coragem de enunciar que é contra. Encontra no seu discurso um jeito de caber dentro do discurso de responsabilidade fiscal, incluindo responsabilidade social. Por quê? Porque a economia se diz uma ciência objetiva. Veja, isso não é ideológico. Isso é um conjunto de boas práticas de gestão. Então, todo mundo tem que fazer assim. Todo mundo tem que ser neoliberal, porque o neoliberalismo é científico. Da me do mesmo modo, o nacional desenvolvimentismo do Ciro Gomes se apresenta como científico e se valida onde? Eu estudei economia em Harvard. Mangabeira Unger, Ciro Gomes, Guido Mantega, whatever, qualquer um que fale sobre economia vai tentar validar a sua noção de economia e de produção de riqueza baseado naquilo que estudou e nas instituições que frequentou. Por isso, está na moda botar que estudou em Harvard no currículo, mesmo que seja só uma vontade. Uh, tem muito aí da questão também do centro, né? Harvard está no centro de poder, mas tem muito da questão central do próprio conhecimento. O conhecimento é central na nossa sociedade, ou deveria ser. E aí tentam lá um aspecto científico, por exemplo, ao terraplanismo. Não sei se já viram alguns vídeos de terraplanista, mas eles tentam argumentar do ponto de vista científico, embora às vezes pareça ridículo, mas eles tentam. Ok? So, when we acquire scientific knowledge, we are also acquiring power. And scientific knowledge is produced by means of language. So, I'm trying to show you here the strict relationship between knowledge, language, and power. Power can only be exerted through language. So, another possibility for us to observe the will to truth is the myth that surrounds the native speaker of the language. Oh, good teachers are native. Okay, so here uh, we have the idea of authority involved. They are better teachers. Why? Because they are authorities over the language. They are the owners of the language. They were born speaking this language. We have discussed this here in this class. Is it always true? Is it always true that a native American 
will be a better teacher than a Brazilian graduated in language? We have here a fight over scientific knowledge from the Brazilian foreigner teacher and the practical knowledge of the language, not formalized by science, the and the cultured uh, knowledge, and we have a dispute over these two knowledges. So if one is a native speaker of a particular language, he or she is considered to be the owner of the language and thus a better teacher. And then if, if we get the, the word owner from Portuguese, dono, dominio. And most schools promise you to be dominated, dominating the English language by the end of the course. Is it really possible to dominate a language? Would you say that you have, because you understand this class in English, would you say that you master the language? That you dominate no. it? <laughs> no. Would you say that I do? Language uh, is escaping me all the time. Yes. Uh, well, uh, language, uh, Antonio, language is always escaping, isn't it? Language is always uh, involuntary, not always, but sometimes involuntary. The analisandum will produce what we call uh, uh, ato falho. The psychoanalyst is looking for what escapes in the analisandum's language, isn't it? Yes, yes. that's true. So, we are try we are not uh, always uh, i mean the psychoanalyst and also the discourse analyst we are not looking for what was calculated what was rationalized we are looking for what escapes what is in the in between the lines what is behind sometimes we are not even looking at what was said but looking at what was silenced what was not said, what was interdicted, considered a taboo, you see? So it's not possible to master a language. In fact, we are subjects of language. Everyone that speaks a language is a subject. Sujeito da linguagem e sujeito na linguagem. So há uma maneira de eu me identificar. É por meio da linguagem. Antônio? Eu? Sim, quando ele responde eu, ele foi interpelado. Ele se reconheceu como a única pessoa possível de ter voz nesse momento. É isso que a gente chama de interpelação da linguagem. Ao nomear algo ou alguém, aquilo é identificável. Antônio não é Gabriel. E se eu tivesse dois Gabriéis em sala, talvez eu tivesse que nomeá-lo pelo sobrenome. Para que eu pudesse melhor interpelá-lo. Isso se dá por meio da linguagem. Ao entrar no universo da linguagem, nós nos assujeitamos, nós nos constituímos como sujeitos, mas nós também temos algum grau de agência. Né? É como pegar um bonde andando. Você entra no bonde, ele está em movimento. Já tinha gente lá dentro. E você coexiste ali por um tempo, mas uma hora você tem que descer do bonde. E o bonde vai seguir o seu curso, carregando outras pessoas. We enter language by means of this metaphor. When we get into language and when we make use of language to say I am Ushua and not somebody else, I do it, but there are other people who came before me. A outra voz de que Foucault fala, que o precede, but there will be more people after me that will get inside the buzz of language. And that I'll leave sometime in my life. But these people will keep language moving on. So uh, it's really hard to say that someone masters a language, any language. In fact, we are mastered by it, we are not mastered, but constituted by language, and we constitute our social relations 
and we constitute anything we do in the world by means of language. Even those who don't speak, uh, I mean, a spoken language, but they communicate by means of a language such as Libras. So everybody is a subject of language. We think in language. We write in language. We act in and by means of language. Questions on this? Right? So moving to the next three concepts on Foucault. Just a moment. We discussed the three external devices to, la to language, which are the forbidden word, madness, and the will to power. And now we are going to talk about the devices of regulating and controlling discourse, which are internal to language. I mean, they are intrinsically linguistic. And this, I think, is more related to what we do as linguists. So as exclusion systems that are internal to discourse, Foucault will refer to those who are exercised in and by language. And they are the commentary principle, authorship, and discipline. Okay, so these are the three uh, devices for controlling language, which are intrinsically linguistic. Now, what's the commentary? The commentary is a principle that will deny the existence of interpretation. As I said before, what I said is what I said. What I said is the truth. Anything that is discrepant from, from what I say is false. And it disconsiders, it erases, erases the fact that language is interpretative. It invests in the illusion that language is transparent. Okay, just a moment. It invests in the notion of transparency of language. That language is capable of transmitting meaning with a flawless, flawlessless, well, quasi no sai, uh, capability that language will never fail. Language will always be objective. So if you have the truth, the truth that comes from the expert transmitted by means of language will always be the truth because he or she is the authority that organizes meaning. So if you are sick, consult a doctor. If you have a dispute in court, talk to a lawyer. If you are in economic trouble, talk to an economist. And then we, we are led to the idea of discipline that will be touching in some minutes. So biblical texts, for example, in Sermon of the Priest or the Pastor, invest in the commentary concept. The commentary concept will say, what I say is not interpretation. What I say is factual. It's written. It's here. Homosexuality is a sin because in cap chapter so and so, versicle so and so, it is written. And it's the word of God. You see? The same happens to economy. The same happens to math. Okay? This equation should be solved like this and that because according to authority so-and-so, this is the recipe for uh, successfully solving the problem. So the discourse of a determined uh, leader or of a political party about Marxism follows this rule, this scientific, supposedly scientific knowledge. knowledge okay? These interpreters of what's written, of what was said, of tradition, they deny the fact that they are attaching their values and their own beliefs to their words. When we speak, we speak from a social and historical positioning. 
But when we invest in the erasing of the social positioning, we are hanging on the commentary principle. We try to say, no, I'm neutral. What I say is scientific. I'm being neutral. Scientific language is fundamental on the commentary. When we quote someone, according to Jesse Souza, page so and so, then you open inverted commas and you quote. When you quote, you are trying to say, this is not me speaking. This is somebody else who is an authority, and I'm just agreeing with him. So in order to have your interpretation associated with the truth, you claim to speak, uh, and you cling to the view that language is transparent, obvious, unambiguous, identical with itself, that what was said here today, if said tomorrow, in any other circumstance, will have the same meaning. So you try to stabilize, to make meaning stable, fundamenting yourself in the old Saucerian structuralist perspective. As we discussed before, Saucier uh, decided to study, study language as a system and not as individual realization. So when you fundament yourself in the commentary concept, and this is not always a conscious movement, but when you try to erase yourself from what you say and giving it universal validity, you are investing in the structural character of language. I don't know. Cigarros fazem mal à saúde. Isso é válido hoje, amanhã, depois de amanhã, a qualquer momento. E é assim porque é assim. Não sou eu que estou falando da posição é, de antitabagista ou de pró-tabagista. Olavo discorda, né? Sim, Olavo discorda. E ele vai jurar que o que ele diz é a verdade. E que não é ele que diz. Veja, está escrito em lugar tal, isso é besteira. Fulano, pesquisa tal e tal, já confirmou. Né? A Pepsi adoça a bebida com, com fetos humanos, está em estudo tal, tal. Ele nunca diz que é ele. Né? Não tem aquela coisa de fonte myes.com, né? como a maioria do pessoal que o segue. Né? Tem gente que faz questão de dizer que isso é opinião pessoal. E aí se começa... Quando você usa a expressão in my opinion, né? or in my humble opinion, que é bem comum, né? tem até abreviação para isso em inglês, né? é você está enfraquecendo o princípio do comentário. Você está deixando claro, isso aqui é subjetivo, isso aqui é, é, é experiência individual, são valores meus. Quando você diz, de acordo com ciência tal, mais do que de acordo com fulano, mas de acordo com os cardiologistas, isso e aquilo e aquilo outro, ou de acordo com infectologistas, a, a taxa de transmissão é de um para dois, você está dando objetividade ao seu dizer, despessoalizando o seu dizer e se retirando no comentário. O sermão religioso tem muito disso. Seja de qual religião for, ele tenta transmitir aquela doutrina como uma verdade válida ao longo do tempo. Porque quase todas as religiões são milenares. Né? E elas tentam trazer esses valores como válidos independente de qualquer mudança social ou histórica. Isso vale para o cristianismo, para o budismo, para o é, umbandismo, qualquer segmento. Você se retira da interpretação do texto é, com o qual dialoga e diz, é o texto. É assim. Está escrito assim. Qualquer coisa fora disso é desvio. E não sou eu que estou dizendo. É o texto que diz. A gente faz muito isso na academia. Olha, não sou eu que estou dizendo. Está no corpus. Não sou eu que estou dizendo. A fonte é autor tal. O princípio do comentário ele é muito importante para dar força de argumentos. É o famoso recurso de autoridade. Dúvida sobre isso, gente? Nenhuma. Então, 
por exemplo, combate à corrupção. Já viram alguém ser a favor da corrupção? Ninguém tem coragem de dizer que não. é a corrupção. O mais corrupto dos corruptos vai ser contra a corrupção. Porque esse é um discurso colocado na ordem do proibido, do tabu, né, da palavra proibida, e por meio do princípio do comentário, por mais corrupta que sua prática seja, você vai disfarçá-la, justificá-la na fala de outrem, por mais corrupta que seja a sua prática, você vai dizer que você é ficha limpa. E que, portanto, você defende um país livre de corrupção. Saca como funciona? So we have, for example, different Marxisms, different Christianities, which will ratify the presence of interpretation and the existence uh, of commentary. Okay? Uh, we have Leninist Marxism, we have Trotskyist Marxism, we have liberal Marxism, we have uh, Gramscian Marxism, Foucaultian Marxism. On the other hand, we have different uh, forms of uh, defending capitalism. We have different Christianities, and this is given by the different denominations of Protestant churches. We have the Christianity of Assembleia, we have the Christianity of the Catholic Church, the Christianity of the uh, Spiritism, and so on, Cardicism. They are different interpretations, but all of them will say they are Christian. All of them will say they are Marxists. They will not say, ah, I'm a Marxist like this. And no, Marx said like this. And my understanding, they will not say my understanding is, but their understanding is in a certain way, different from other Marxists. So similarly, we can mention the different interpretations of, of a law from the prosecutor and the defense. The defense. In a court, in a court, you have the judge. Bom, se o juiz não for Sérgio Moro, na corte você tem o um juiz que é neutro, o promotor e o advogado. E cada um vai se fundamentar o quê? Na lei. Todos eles vão dizer é a lei. Mas no fundo, é como eu interpreto a lei. Estou falando da corte normal, tá, gente? Antes da vaza jato. So, uh, another important linguistic notion is the notion of authorship. And authorship is an illusion. It's a, a, an illusion that we invest on, again, to make our arguments valid. The illusion that we are the origin of what we say. E agora eu vou lá no Foucault, lá no comecinho do livro que ele fala que gostaria de entrar e fazer aquela palestra, não como se ele fosse a fonte do que ele vai dizer, mas como se uma voz há muito o precedesse. What Foucault is talking about is that we tend to believe that we are the source of what we think, of what we say, and of what we do. We erase our social and the culturated nature. Uh, human beings are social beings. So they are a product of their social and historical origin. And we cannot really say that our ideas are completely original, so we are not really authors of anything. Nor that our ideas belong to any, anyone because they are a product of context and interdiscourse. Now, what is interdiscourse? Interdiscourse is the network of possible discourses over a period of time, over a certain society, and they get interconnected, intercrossed, sometimes with touching points, intersections. So there are moments in which medical discourse and economic discourse touch each other. Especially during the pandemic, we heard about the conflict between health and economy. And some people say, oh, to have a good economy, we should have health because there's no economy without people. And others trying to disconnect this discourse saying, 
the economy is more important than health. And others say health is more important than the economy. But there are uh, people trying to make these two perspectives dialogue. Okay, So we have this idea that what we say is what we say. If I tell you... Uh, I am in favor of uh, auxílio emergencial. Eu sou a favor do auxílio emergencial. E eu digo isso, e em qualquer fórum que me perguntem, eu sustento isso, porque esse é o jeito que eu penso, porque esse é o jeito que eu acho certo. Eu, eu, eu. Eu sou a origem, eu me responsabilizo pelo que eu digo. I think, therefore, I exist. Esse é o sujeito moderno, cartesiano. I think, therefore, I exist. I am an author. Eu sou agente no mundo. Eu faço as coisas. É o Austin. Eu digo, portanto, eu faço. Dizer e fazer se equivalem. E eu me responsabilizo pelo meu dito. É assim que é o sujeito jurídico, o sujeito das leis. Eu não posso dizer uma frase racista, ou homofóbica ou xenófoba sem ser legalmente responsabilizado por ela. Porque considera-se que, como um sujeito da linguagem, eu sei e me responsabilizo pelo meu dizer, a menos que eu seja louco. Que aí a gente volta lá no outro conceito cotidiano. Esse é um dos esquecimentos de que a Annie Orland vai falar depois no livro que nós vamos ler. So, when Foucault speaks at the very beginning of his book, of a voice that speaks before him. He's referring to the concept of interdiscourse, which consists on all the words and knowledge that circulated before us and that surround our words. Basically, the context. The discourses we heard about, the knowledge we heard about, the knowledge we got in touch with. So, interdiscourse is a set of possible discourses in a given era, in a given area of knowledge, in a given society. For example, let's talk about K-pop. K-pop is nothing more than a rereading of English North American boy bands and girl bands. You see, it's a reapproach. It's another How can I say? É a releitura. Boy bands from the 90s, like New Kids on the Block or uh, Backstreet Boys, more recently, they are nothing but a rereading of boy bands such as the Beatles or the Animals. You see? Menudo. Menudo. Yeah. <laughs> Blitz. What is the difference between Blitz and Restart? Of course, there are differences, but they are based on, based on everything we do, everything we say, everything we produce academically, economically, an invention is based on something else. We are not the source of what we say. We always depend on somebody else's knowledge to produce new knowledge. That's why... Uh, When we talk about this uh, this idea, when we talk about this idea of authorship, it's a problem because authorship is always based on somebody else's knowledge. Before Santos Dumont, somebody else has tried to fly. Leonardo da Vinci was already trying to build a flying machine. The Wright brothers claim that they, they did it, that they made it. And there is dispute over this. So, originality is not that original. So, from this perspective, it's a bit of nonsense talking about intellectual property, talking about copyright. From the Foucaultian, from the radical Foucaultian interpretation, copyright is a fallacy, is an illusion. There should be no copyright, because I'm, I'm, I'm only able to write a doctor's thesis because I had an elementary school teacher. So part of the credit for my thesis should be given to my elementary school teacher. 
And my elementary school teacher had another teacher who had another teacher and so on. So knowledge is social. Authorship is not individual. Authorship is somehow social. Foucault proposes that texts, considering texts, the meanings and discourses that are all around, will always exist linked to other texts and to other discourses. So they are never completely original. A teacher, but then there is no originality at all. There is. There is a displacement movement. But there's not the thing that, oh, Eureka, I found it. No, you found it because you were prepared intellectually to find out something. You see? So these texts say what has been said before by saying something else slightly different. Okay? Or by saying either by saying something else or by saying the same thing in a slightly different way. From this perspective, for example, Einstein's physics would be impossible without Newton's physics. And engineering wouldn't be possible without uh, Euclidean uh, geometry. You see what I mean? Everything new is based on something else that is considered to be old. The basis of our knowledge is a previous knowledge. Everything I say was taught. This is endoculturation. Everything I say, the way I think, the way I behave in society, was taught me by my parents, my brothers, my friends, my uh, trade union uh, partners, uh, my students. You see? I'm a social being. So my discovery is not mine. It's collective. This is the basis of most anarchist and uh, libertarian movements on free software. Have you ever heard about Linux? Do you have to buy Linux? Alguém já usou Linux aqui? O quê? Não estou ouvindo, professor. Sistema operacional Linux, alguém já usou? Não, não, nunca usei. What is the principle behind Linux? Is Linux, do you have to pay for it? Uh, if you heard about Linux, you probably know that when you buy a notebook or a PC with Linux, you pay less for it. Because you do not have to pay for software. You are only buying hardware. Linux is distributed for free. And there is contribution on it. The code is open. If you have a problem in Windows, you have to wait for Microsoft to release an update to fix that error. Now, if you have a problem in Linux and you are a programmer, you can open the software, the code, and you can fix it and you can share it. It's shared knowledge. It's basically the knowledge model of academic environment. Knowledge is free. Knowledge is there. Just go to the library. Just search the article and quote it. If you want to use my solution, just quote me. This is a kind of license called Creative Commons. Every scientific paper, unless a word country, is uh, has a Creative Commons license. You know what I mean? Então, todo o, esse movimento de software livre que a gente tem na rede, de código aberto, ele deriva um pouco dessa concepção de que a autoria não existe a rigor. Ela existe, existe a, cria, a criatividade, mas toda a criatividade cria sobre algo que já existiu antes. E isso se dá na linguagem. We speak and we give new meanings and we produce knowledge by means of a language that has thousands of years. It is thousands of years. And this language comes from another language which is thousands and thousands of years older. You see? So 
since we use a social device to communicate and produce knowledge, this knowledge is as social as the language, which is the support for its transmission. Questions on this? So, I already answered you. Foucault and free software have this in common, that everything that is created is created based on something else. So, the author is a problematic concept for Michel Foucault. It's not that the author does not exist, but it's a constitutive illusion. Se eu pensar que tudo que eu disse hoje nessa aula já foi dito por alguém, ou mesmo por mim no semestre anterior, eu nem venho aqui dizer. Eu mando vocês verem o vídeo, meu ou de outra pessoa que já disse. Eu tenho que me constituir na ilusão de que o que eu vou dizer é uma novidade. Senão eu fico mudo. E isso é um traço, inclusive, psicopatológico. Né? Aquele que não enuncia, aquele que silencia o tempo todo, é porque ele não consegue esquecer dessa questão Foucaultiana de que ele não é a origem do próprio dizer, de que o dizer dele é social, socialmente marcado, socialmente determinado. Eu não diria determinado, mas marcado. Por outro lado, aquele que se crê completamente original acaba por ignorar um conhecimento construído anteriormente, uma estética que já existia, um conhecimento, um conceito já existente que ele trabalha sobre tudo bem, gente? Ou tá muito filosófico demais? Não, tranquilo, professor. É isso mesmo. Ok. E aí, baseado nessa noção de autoria, nós temos daí, vamos lá, morfossintase, autoria. Quais as palavras vocês conseguem derivar disso? Autor, autorização. Desautorização. Desautorização, né, de quem não tem o, o conhecimento para ser um autor. Autoria é aquele que acredita ser o dono do dizer, ou daquele segmento né? do dizer, a autoridade. E toda autoridade precisa se constituir dentro de uma, vamos pensar, autoridade acadêmica. Não faria o mínimo sentido eu estar aqui para vocês dando uma aula de engenharia porque esse não é o meu campo do saber, essa não é a minha disciplina. E aí Foucault vai falar de como o discurso é distribuído assimetricamente dentro de um saber disciplinar. So discipline is another device intrinsically linguistic that will distribute power and discourse. Discipline is a set of methods, approaches, concepts that work to produce an isolated medium of action. A club. A club of the specialized ones. So, this action is not for everyone. This action is made rare. It's rarefied. Accessible to but a few. Discipline will deny the existence of the commentary. I mean, Discipline will then deny the existence of interpretation and will claim to be accurate and objective. So we have many disciplines in the university. We have medicine, we have pharmacy, we have physics, math, uh, engineering, and so on, and literature and linguistics. And each of them have their proper methods, their proper truths, and they claim to be accurate and objective. And they are made up of truths and gaps. They have some truths, and by means of these truths and the development of concepts fundamented in these truths, they try to fill in the gaps in their theories. So we can draw a parallel between discipline and language and the disciplinary truths and polysemy. We have disciplinary truths that we call axioms. Os axiomas, eles são aquelas verdades absolutas que fundamentam aquele saber disciplinar, aquele campo do saber. 
Por outro lado, naquele campo do saber, por não ser completo, isso, o que inviabilizaria qualquer produção, ele precisa preencher lacunas. Eu me fundamento em saberes anteriores para produzir novos saberes, né? novas verdades disciplinares que, por não serem garantidas que chegarão ao meu, ao meu receptor da maneira pelas quais eu projetei, elas são polissêmicas, questionáveis, teorias podem ser superadas, melhoradas ou até mesmo cair. Ok? So discipline works to make the means of knowledge creation and circulation scarce, still reflecting social values. Before, people like Da Vinci, they were painters, engineers, philosophers, uh, linguists, they were everything and nothing at the same time. They, they had a generalistic knowledge. With the coming of uh, Industrial Revolution, with the new division of labor, especially with 19th century uh, and in the Industrial Revolution, uh, discipline was reinforced. So you should be a specialist. You should know a lot about something and nothing about everything else, or almost nothing, at least. So similarly, polysemy is delimited and shaped by language, which reflects society. The same way we try to control the discourse about some area of knowledge, knowledge we try to control the polysemic aspect of language. What is the polysemic aspect of the language? Everything I say can be interpreted in a different way from what I actually think I said. Não sei se vocês já tiveram a experiência de ter que se explicar. Fala, não, gente, peraí, vocês me entenderam mal. Já aconteceu com vocês? Falarem uma coisa, você falar cenouras e o cara entender beterrabas? Sim. Quem é casado faz isso toda hora, professor. Yeah, this is not what I mean. E aí você vai para a pessoa, I'm sorry, this is not what I mean. So when you say this is not what I mean, it is a symptom that meaning is not controllable, that meaning is not guaranteed, that meaning is not transparent, because you may mean something, but what you said may affect your interlocutor in a completely different way from what you calculated before. So meaning should be restricted, It should be polished the same way that disciplines try to restrict about what we can say, the topics that we can talk about. Narrow-mind us, they try to make us narrow-minded and biased only by that disciplinary truth. Okay? That's why economists sometimes can only see social problems from the perspective of economy and not from the perspective of human uh, uh, human problems, I mean social problems. Like, uh, they can reduce everything to money. So they can talk about education from the perspective of economic growth. They can talk about sanitary problems from the perspective of economic growth because they are limited and they are biased by that disciplinary knowledge. Okay. So, discourse analysis is one of the areas of knowledge that will try to surpass and confront this notion of discipline. Psychoanalysis, as well, will try to confront this notion of discipline. Can I have a psychoanalysis course In a university, Antônio? Não conheço, professor. Acho que não. They, they don't want to be a discipline. Psychoanalysis tries to question, to confront, and to break the, uh, this idea that the word about someone, someone's mind belongs only to the doctor or to the psychologist. Anyone can take a psychoanalysis course as long as this person has the elementary reading 
and uh, the understanding of what he or she is reading. But anyone can study psychoanalysis and self-declare a psychoanalyst. There is no regulation. Uh, of course, I know there are some associations, but they are not, I mean, there will not be a CRM or OAB or something the like that will come to my home and say, you could not be a psychoanalyst because you do not have our registration card. Because this course analysis and psychoanalysis try to confront the disciplinary power of science. So this course analysis is the in the in-between, in what we call entre lugar, uh, we are in between philosophy, psychology, linguistics, history, psychoanalysis, sociology, but we are not sociologists, we are not historians, we are not philosophers, we are not psychologists, and we are all of them. You see? We are moving different areas of disciplinary knowledge and trying to interconnect them to produce linguistic interpretation. And maybe that's why discourse analysis has been marginalized over a quite long period of time. It's now a fashion, but it was not always like that. In the same way, psychoanalysis may be now a fashion, but some people called psychoanalysts charlatans uh, because they were not inserted in the medical discourse. So we are an interdisciplinary knowledge. Now, what is the problem of not being aware of the story of the history of discourse analysis? Is the risk that some people run of trying to turn discourse analysis another discipline, another disciplinary power. What we really want to do is to talk about things that we are not the specialists and interconnect knowledges and not, not to produce a new small club of discourse analysts or an only myself, only we, discourse analysts, can do discourse analysis because we are the specialists. This is, again, rarefaction, and this would be a contradiction. A contradiction about which I may record a video for you finishing this class because I know you have to have lunch. And uh, we are running on time, so I'll try to finish this class by means of a complimentary video and share this video for today and the next one uh, in SIGA. Okay, we have a normal class next, next Thursday, but I'll share this video and another one uh, in SIGA, the, compl the complement of this class uh, by at least maximum the end of the week. Okay, do you have any questions about what has been said today? Okay, no Would question. You like to make any consideration or something? Is this okay? Okay, professor. Tá bom então, gente. Eu vou compartilhar esse vídeo na rede, tá e gravar um complemento dele que finaliza essa aula. Tá bom? Ok. Professor, para semana que vem é a Orlando, né? É para semana que vem é em Orlando, isso. Que bom que você mencionou. Tá, tá o bom. Pessoal que vai ver depois já já vai lendo Orlando. Tá bom. Tá. Abraço, gente. Ok, boa tarde a todos. Boa tarde, boa tarde.